Thank you so much, Shelley. And we look forward to celebrating with you after the service. At this time, I'd like to dismiss any, uh, any parents who would like to send their children to kids' worship. Uh, it's over in the administrative wing, and Ms. Jill, our children's ministry director, is standing over there uh, waiting for you. Uh, it's specifically for any children ages three through second grade. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 21, or sorry, chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want, to do with, what do you, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you that not only have you made us, not only have you set your love upon us in Christ Jesus, but you have given us your word that we might know you better, that we might understand what we're here for and where our hope is. We pray, Lord, that as Pastor Herb brings this message, you would encourage him by your spirit, that you would fill us with a reminder of our salvation, and that you would change us and mold us and shape us by word and spirit, that we might walk with you more closely and love you more deeply. To the praise of your glorious name, In Jesus' name, amen. Two times in our passage, the people were amazed. Did you notice that? What would it take to amaze you. If I had six of these bottles and could juggle them in front of you, <laughs> would that amaze you? It amazed me too, because <laughs> I can't juggle at all. How about if I got a three-year-old up here to recite the Apostles' Creed by memory? Would that, would that amaze you? Yeah, maybe so, yeah. Um, because in some ways, this is Shelley's day, I'm, I'm going to give one illustration about Shelley. Um, that would be natural. And then I'll do one about myself, so that, that balances it out. But, um, you know, Shelley grew up on a farm, and, and she loved cats, and she's always loved cats. And, and I even gave her a, a Persian cat for a, an engagement present. Wow, yeah. Um, some years ago, she developed, we've always had cats, until she developed an allergy to the cats. And so uh, we, we had cats outside probably most of the time since then. Right now, we have four cats that have, um, I built them a hotel for the outside <laughs> and, and a feeding station. I did that not because I love cats, but because I love Shelly. <laughs> and I also love to build things. So, you know, they, they've got it pretty good. Uh, they, they eat inside, but they're, but they're outside cats. And, and so Shelly knows an awful lot about cats, about their behavior, and, and she can make them come to her, and, and they run away from me. I guess there's, you know, anyway, that's kind of the thing. But she has knowledge of cats and an interest in cats. And so one of the favorite things that she loves to do is look at cat videos on Instagram. You know, I have never been drawn to that, but, but there is one, there's one that's her favorite. 
And you got to understand, she knows and understands how cats act. And so this, this Instagram video has these two cats at a dish. And the one cat eats from the dish and then pushes the dish to the other cat. The other cat eats some of the food and then pushes the, cat, the, the, the dish back to the other cat. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. Of course, Shelly shows this to me. Aren't you amazed by that? I said, yeah, that's all right, yeah. <laughs> but, you, you know, she is amazed at all those. And she's always showing me <laughs> these amazing cat videos. Well, anyway, um, I'm going to share another thing about myself now, a second illustration uh, that may surprise you a little bit. Um, uh, you know I talk about football all the time. I played football, uh, I coached football, I loved football, I still love football. But you might be surprised that I was on the gymnastics team in high school. Don't I look like a gymnast? <laughs> but, but I was, I wasn't very good, but I made the team. And, and in, my, in my teaching and coaching career, I had the opportunity at Westminster High School for four years to be the men's gymnastics coach. And we did very well. And, and I enjoyed it, not because I could do the things or demonstrate the things that these young men were doing, but because I could see them make progress and I could see the, the joy that they had in being able to do a trick and, and, and doing a routine and, and so forth and so on. Well, let me get to the amazing part. Last Saturday, uh, Shelly and I were watching the, the women's national final gymnastics meet um, on television. And, and I don't know if you've ever heard of, of uh, Simone Biles or not. Any of you? Does that name ring a bell with any of you? She's the greatest gymnast that's ever lived. And she can prove, I can prove that with you by telling you that she has won the national championship in America for seven straight years. And we got to see her on the uneven bars, but got to see her do a vault. Now... You gotta understand, a vault is not a, you're not trampolining. You run up, you hit a rooter board, you put your hands on the, on the horse, and then you do a gymnastics move. She can run down the runway, hit the rooter board, turn sideways, push off of the, of the, of the uh, horse, and do a triple twisting double somersault. She's the only person in the world that can do that. Now, I've had, I've had guys do handstands. <laughs> One revolution. And that was pretty tough. Double somersault, triple twisting vault and sticking it. Now that, to me, is amazing. Partly, now some of you say, well, okay. But some of you, if you know gymnastics and you enjoy gymnastics, and you, you're interested in gymnastics, you could say, that is amazing. Because I'm going to give you a definition of amazing. Amazing, to be amazed, requires knowledge and interest in what happens. I'm going to keep on that theme. Definition of amazed is overwhelmed with surprise or wonder. You know... Uh, overwhelmed with surprise and wonder. Now, that can only happen to you if you have knowledge of what's going on. It also will not happen to you unless you have an interest in what is going on. In our story, and it is a story, it's a wonderful story, it is the story of, of, of Jesus' first teaching episode in his life, in his ministry, in his public ministry. And through his teaching and his action, we are told twice that the people are amazed. They are overwhelmed with surprise and wonder. And dear friends, it requires knowledge and it requires interest. And here's my big idea for the day, and I'm going to come back with it. Believers should never stop being amazed at what Jesus does. Let me say that again. Believers should never stop being amazed at what Jesus does in your life and in the life of others. And I want you to be aware of that definition 
And I want you to put yourself into this story because this story is for you and for me. And it is a challenge for you and, and, and me to also be amazed at Jesus' work in our lives and in the lives of fellow believers. How does Jesus amaze? He amazes with his words. Not with a juggling act, not with, a, not with an Instagram video. You know, I think in part sometimes we are, so, we are so bombarded with things that we can watch and think that maybe we miss the amazing thing that Jesus does around us. The amazing thing that God does in our lives and in others. The amazing thing that the Holy Spirit brings about. But we've got to be knowledgeable, and we've got to be interested. Now, this passage, verse uh, 23 in in Mark's gospel, we're looking at Jesus in action. That's the, the theme of this series as we go through the gospel of Mark. He comes to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is going to be his base of operation in Galilee. It's not that far from Nazareth. But Nazareth is a, is a backwater town. You know, the people made fun of that. If you read the first chapter of John, you'll see you know, uh, them making fun of the fact that, that Peter says this, this man is from, uh, from Nazareth. And uh, one of the guys says, uh, what good thing comes out of Nazareth? Think of a town that you would kind of have that attitude about, and that was Nazareth. So Jesus goes to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is a, is a crossroads town. So it's a, it's a commercial town. It's, it's on the Sea of Galilee. The, 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 the fishing uh, team or fishing company of Peter, John, James, uh, Peter Andrew, James, and John, and, and John's father, and other workers, it's, it's, they have a big fishing operation. Her last time that they left their fishing operation to follow Jesus. And so Jesus has decided to, to, to have as his headquarters um, Peter, Andrew, James, and John's town, Capernaum. And they're following him. And Jesus begins his public teaching ministry in a synagogue. Now, we've all been through a pandemic. Praise, praise the Lord that we're almost through it. I hope soon completely. And we say, why would God allow that? Well, what happened to the people of Israel when they went into captivity? They were supposed, the worship center was where? Jerusalem. That's where they really worshiped God. That's where God lived. That's where they saw God in that holy of holies the, in the, between the, the cherubim. That was where the, 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 the Day of Atonement uh, sacrifices were made and all those things. And now they're in Assyria, they're in Babylon, they're in Persia. They can't be there. So what happened? Well, they get together as families to study God's word and to pray and to share what they, you know, in, in a small group, what they believe the passage is telling them how to live. And so the synagogue came out of the exile. It came out of the pain of that difficulty. So understand that God is is at work in our lives through this pandemic and he will bring us through and there will be things that he will do because of it that will enable us to further the kingdom of God. Convinced of that, even though I'm not sure yet what it is. And so synagogues became the center of the town. If there was a group of Jews of 10 families or more, Ten families or more, they were to have a synagogue. And so, how are we doing, Art? We're getting some feedback here. Okay, thank you. Um, and so, th- throughout Israel, and in, 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 in the, in, in the uh, dispersion, there were Jewish synagogues. Now, they didn't exactly worship there. They prayed. They read the bur- Word of God, the Old Testament, probably in Hebrew, and not everybody could speak Hebrew, so someone then would explain what that passage meant in Aramaic. Now, Aramaic is another word for Syrian, okay? 
That was the big language through Babylon and Syria. And so they, they spoke Aramaic. Uh, the only words we have in, in Aramaic in the, in, the, in the English Bible is Jesus on the cross saying, Eli, Eli, lamak sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Aramaic. If you saw the, 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 the movie The Passion of the Christ, that whole thing was done in Aramaic. But the idea of the synagogue was to come together and learn God's word. Now, each synagogue didn't have a preacher of its, of its own. It had a synagogue ruler. He was a, an administrator. And he would invite knowledgeable people to come in and, and read. they would read the scripture and then the, that person would comment. And typically, I, I hear from scholars, it was pretty boring. You know, they would go into the law, and they would go into the details of the law, the minutiae of the law, how you have to do this and you do that, and you add, add this and add that. And, and so it was not a favorite thing, but people did it regularly on the Sabbath. And then there's this new rabbi named Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, who comes to their synagogue in Capernaum, and teaches in a different way. Now, what was the content of Jesus' teaching? What does Mark say about the content? Absolutely nothing. All we know is the reaction of the people. Now, what do you think Jesus would have been preaching about? Well, we know he'd been... He started out and said, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near. Believe the good news. And what is the good news? That God loves us. That God is going to provide a way for our sins to be removed. That God is a God of compassion, of mercy, and of grace. God is personal. So these were the themes I believe that Jesus was teaching in that synagogue. And the people were amazed. Why? Partly because of what he was saying. Largely because he was pre presenting the gospel. And if you can remember a time in your life when you had, didn't know Jesus Christ, if you know a time in your life when you didn't know the gospel, there might have been a moment in your life like there was in mine when I heard the gospel and understood it for the first time and it changed my life. And it changed yours. And so these people were hearing something that they'd never heard before. They were hearing good news. And they were hearing it preached in a way that they'd never heard it preached. Because the pattern of the, of the, of the scribes, the pattern of the synagogue was to never for a scribe to give his own personal opinion. But to always quote somebody else. Have you ever been around a person who never gives their opinion but is always quoting somebody else? I think they're pretty rare, but I, I know a pastor like that. You know, and it drives me crazy. You know, he's always quoting so-and-so. So-and-so said this. So-and-so said that. And so-and-so said that. I said, well, please tell me, what do you think? Because by listening just to some, what anybody else says, you know, you prove that you've read and you've studied and you, know, you have all this knowledge. But when they heard Jesus preach... They heard God speaking. God speaking to their heart. God speaking into their life. God speaking to them in a way that they understood that God was calling them to respond in faith and love and obedience. They were hearing all these things. And they hadn't heard that before. And so, just in Jesus' words, they were amazed. How often are you amazed at the Word of God? I hope it's frequently. It may not be every day. We're not told how often it happens. But I pray that you and I, just in the reading of God's Word, at moments when God sort of jumps out of the page and speaks to your heart and into your need of your life, and you see, well, this is what, this is what I want to, should be doing. That you understand that God is speaking to you by the Holy Spirit and you should be amazed. I hope you are.
Now there's a second reason why they were amazed. And this is the action part of the story. Not the content, but in the middle, at, I think as, as Jesus was teaching and as they were listening to Jesus and as they were getting more excited and more convicted and more ready to respond in, 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 to, to what Jesus was saying, there's this insane person standing up and yelling at Jesus. Now, just for just a moment, if, if I was at the end of a sermon and had just given my, let's say, an invitation or a challenge, and one of you st stood up and started screaming at me, do you think you'd be distracted? You know, I've only had that happen one time. I, uh, one, we, were, we had Sunday evening services some years ago, and, and I remember there were ladies sitting back in there, and, and I had gone through the pa passage, and she stood up and started telling me what I should have been saying and so forth and so on. That was, it was interesting. I hadn't had that happen before. And, and I said, dear lady, please sit down. God's anointing is on me for this situation. This is my time to speak the word of God. We'll talk later. Now, in this particular instance, I believe something was very, very significant was happening. One of you gave me an insight two weeks ago that I really wanted to pass on. You know, Jesus in the desert had victory over Satan, right? Three times. We, we didn't look at that passage specifically, but, but in general, there were three main temptations that we can read in Matthew, and Jesus had victory in all four. Jesus had the victory all three times, and Satan had the loss all three times. Satan was defeated all three times. But as I shared in that sermon two weeks ago, Satan doesn't quit. He won't quit until the final day of judgment. Jesus was tempted throughout his uh, uh, earthly ministry, and so will our temptations be. But what happens in this situation? There is a man who is demon-possessed. And I know for us in this modern age of science, we have struggles understanding this. And let me just say, I don't fully understand this, but I believe it's true. Because I believe God's word is true. I believe it's possible for demons to, to take over a, the possession of a person's personality and actually speak through them. I think it's rare, but I think when Jesus was active in his ministry, Satan was active in his desire to crush Jesus. And so demonic activity increased. And so we see that in the scriptures more than we do today. Now, I, that is just a quick, quick idea. But I believe that demon possession can happen. And what's interesting is the dialogue here. And I want to just share with you an insight that, that I got from studying there was the belief that if you could, you could challenge a person and control the conversation and control the person, if you could say their full name and their title. You know, if you stood up and said, Herbert E. Ruby the third, senior pastor at Covenant of Grace, blah, blah, blah. That somehow you could have some kind of control over me. That was what they believed. And so this demon speaking through this man says, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of God? Now, these other people really didn't know Jesus hardly at all, except he was the carpenter's son from over in a small town of Nazareth. They were amazed at his teaching, but they didn't really know him. But, but this demon did. And this demon calls him out. Why? Because he thinks he can defeat Jesus. And, and demonic possession had occurred in, in, in places in, in the past, in, in, in Judaism. And what did, what did they do? Well, they had incantations. You know, word, da-da-da-da, abracadabra, and all that kind of stuff. And then they would have, you know, other kinds of ceremonies and all these kinds of things. Incantations and, 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 and spells and stuff like that to get rid of the demon. That was the expectation. What does Jesus do? says, be quiet. Come out of him. 
All he has to do is speak. Because his words are powerful. And they still are, brothers and sisters, dear friends. The word of God is still powerful. And so instead of Satan winning out this time and distracting that audience, keeping people from responding to the teaching that Jesus had, Satan gets defeated again. Jesus shows in a word how he can have power over evil. Jesus shows in a word that his words can free a person from sin and evil. How did you come to faith? I don't know your, all your stories, but my story is that John 3.16 was quoted to me. And for the first time, I understood that Jesus died for me. My life was changed by the word of God. And so we need to understand that event. We need to see it in the scriptures. The people were amazed that this man was now free and that Jesus had power over evil. They should have also known and remembered that the Bible promised that the Old Testament promised that when the Messiah came, he would cast out evil. The writer of Hebrews chapter in chapter 2, verse 14, speaks of Jesus taking on flesh, and I quote, so that he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. Not only did Jesus destroy that evil, but he gave the man new life and he healed him. And so by his actions, he showed he was the Son of God. Jesus didn't do miracles to show off. He did miracles to show that his power came from his Father in heaven and that his words And his actions changed lives then, and they still can. Never stop being amazed at what Jesus does. But we are, don't we? I'm going to ask you you to look in your own heart. When was the last time you were amazed at something that God did in your life? I'm going to challenge you with four thoughts as I close. Four challenges for applications. Number one, you must have faith to be able to see and be amazed. If you're here today and you don't have faith in Jesus, I would encourage you to examine the truth of Jesus Many of us have seen amazing things that other people cannot see at all because you have to have eyes of faith in order to be amazed. Like I talked about that cat and about that gymnast, if you're going to, you need to have knowledge and you have to have interest or it'll just go right by you. Do you have knowledge of God? Do you have interest in what Jesus is doing in your life and in others? You need that. To be amazed. You need faith. Paul prays for the church in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18. That the eyes of your heart will be enlightened. That the eyes of your heart will be able to see God at work. Be able to see the amazing things that Jesus can do in your life and in others. Number two. You may miss being amazed Because you're so distracted. When we look at the story of Mark, these people lived for God. They didn't understand very well. But God was the center of their community. God was the center of their life. They, you know, they they went to synagogue. They went when if they when when the Jews were free in Israel, they would go to the temple three or four times a year. 
It was the big deal in their life. They, they were interested. They were focused. They, they were not so distracted. Satan is more evil than we can imagine. I am a, a history buff. And my dad was a bomber pilot in World War II, and I'm fascinated by World War II. But some of the things that happened in that war are beyond ugly, beyond belief in evil, evil beyond description. And Satan is that. But he is also, people say, and and accurately, he is the master of distraction. You know, he may not have to to send a demon to work in your life. All he has to do is distract you. Think about it. How often do you think about God? How often do you have have an interest in the things of God, the things about what Jesus is doing in your life and in others? Your life can be so busy that you're not looking, you're not listening, you're not expecting Jesus to be working in your life. And so... Why would you be amazed if you can't see? I would encourage you to have a daily quiet time. Whether it's in the morning, whether it's at lunchtime, whether it's at the evening, at at bedtime, to spend a few moments at least of focusing on God. And if you have trouble with prayer, just pray the Lord's Prayer. Pray that. Just, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, Use me for your kingdom's glory. Just keep focusing on what Jesus is doing and what he's he's done. Third challenge, be in God's word. Again, I I am amazed every... Well, that's maybe a little exaggeration. No, I'm amazed every week in the word of God. I I, I get paid to read and study the scriptures. I've got the best job in the world. I mean that. I'm not, I'm not being hyperbolic here. I, I mean that. I love Mondays because that's usually my study day. And it just thrills me to study the Word of God because I learn every week new things that I didn't know, that I didn't understand, that I can't wait to share with you on Sunday morning. You need to be in God's word because his word will speak to you personally. Holy Spirit has promised to do that. That the word of God is a double-edged sword. It, it's, it's a living thing. It is, as Martin Luther says, the word of God is, is alive. It runs to me. And it will run to you if you're in it. That's my third application and challenge. The fourth and last application and challenge about being amazed. If you want to be amazed... You need to be in his church. You need to be in fellowship with other Christians. Because we'll see God and we'll see Jesus working in somebody else's life and be amazed. And if we're we're living the Christian life in isolation, we'll miss all those opportunities. When were the people amazed in our story that we looked at this morning? When were they amazed? When they got together in the synagogue. When they were were together studying God's word, they were amazed at what Jesus was saying and doing. They were together. So we need each other. We need to be in Christian fellowship. And I promise you, if we're sincere and committed, we will see amazing things in our church and in our groups in our fellowships, in our ministries together. We need each other. And as we commit to each other, we will be amazed. Now, we'll also probably be hurt some. We will certainly be disappointed. We may even be disillusioned at times, but we will also be amazed. As I close... When do we use the word amazing the most? You know, I know the answer to that. When we sing one certain 
song. And probably every person in here knows that song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. That is amazing. That Jesus Christ would die for a selfish jerk like Herb Ruby. That's amazing. And I never want to stop being amazed at that truth. And that, and that reality. And I hope in your heart you can also say that about your own relationship with Jesus. That it's amazing that he loved you so much he would suffer, agonize for you on the cross. And so maybe you'll sing this song. Amazing Jesus, how sweet the name that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Jesus is amazing. May he do amazing things in your life, and may he give you eyes to see, ears to hear, and minds to understand. Shall we pray for that reality? Shall we bow together? Father, thank you for giving us this little story of this brief teaching time when Jesus started his public ministry in a little building in, in Capernaum. He amazed people because he spoke to their hearts. He spoke wonderful, good news that resonated in their minds and they could understand that you loved them and you were willing to die for them and that you would give yourself for them. And that was good news. And Lord, that good news is our calling to share. That good news is ours to live out. I pray that you would give us eyes to see you working in our life. You would give us a desire to read your word. You would give us a desire to be with Christians who are sincere and want to know you and learn about you and be amazed by you and can share their stories together. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the amazing things that you've done among us. We look forward to the amazing things that you still have to do. And as we sing this final song, may we believe in our hearts that you will bring it to pass. I pray this in the precious, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Receive now the benediction of the Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, which empowers us to live, May the love of God, which inspires us in our daily walk, may the, Holy, the power of the Holy Spirit be with us so that we might be part of building that kingdom. May we go in confidence, in love, in humility, and confidence that God will use us in his grace and by his power. Go with his grace.